Good evening and welcome to the College of Worcester. It's great to have you on our campus. Thank you. It's great to have you on our campus, especially for this kind of event. Because after all, that's what the College of Worcester uh, is all about. Dialogue about important issues, sharing of opinions that sometimes differ, looking for places where we can compromise and share an understanding. But in all cases, listening, learning, exchanging views honestly and openly. Uh, so we're very proud uh, to be able to have this, uh, this conversation here tonight with Congressman Bernese. And we're very glad that you, that you came out. Uh, and join us on our campus. You're always welcome. You know that Worcester's open to you for lectures and concerts and sporting events all the time. I see some of you around, and uh, you're always welcome for that. But these kinds of events that are about dialogue, um, that are about bringing communities together to talk about important issues, this speaks very closely to our mission. So we're proud of, to offer this tonight. Um, <clears throat> Congressman Renacci was elected to the House of Representatives last November, as you probably know, representing the 16th District of Ohio, which includes Stark, Wayne, Medina, and Ashland counties. He serves on the House Financial Services Committee, where he is Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions and Consumer Credit. He also serves on the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Before I turn the podium and the evening over to Congressman Renacci, I want to offer a few words about process. The congressman will make some opening remarks and offer a brief PowerPoint overview on the current issues in Washington as, as he sees them. And then he'll open the floor for questions and answers, dialogue. Once that session begins, uh, if you have a, a question that you would like to pose, please raise your hand and one of the volunteers will come around you with a microphone because uh, this is a, a, a fairly intimate menu, but it just works much better if everyone can hear everyone else. And so please wave and use the microphone. Um, and the, the volunteer will actually hold the microphone for you as you, uh, as you pose your question or make your comment. Um, and uh, in the interest of fairness, uh, to get as many people involved as possible, uh, each person should be listed, uh, limited to one question or, or comment. Um, I hope our conversation can be vigorous and probing and, 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 and critical, but always respectful. Um, and always one where we listen carefully uh, to one another's points of view. So with that, um, welcome, Congressman Onesi, to the College of Women.
The U.S. corporate tax rate is 35%. The, North, the, tax, the average tax rate in countries outside of the United States is approximately 24 to 25%. Do you believe the U.S. tax rate is too high? Right now I'm talking about the rate. And again, almost almost uh, 90% think the tax rate is too high. How many people believe the 2009 stimulus passed by the previous Congress worked? Well, we've got a few more, but we're still probably 85%. Believe it did not work. With that, let's go through um, some of these slides. go through some slides. Anybody that's been in my previous uh, town halls know that I try and give you some general information up front. This is where our debt is today. Let's see if I can get this thing to work as far as pointer. Right. As you can see, that's about where our debt is today. This is where it's heading without the Budget Control Act. This is an important slide that I try and put in every presentation I do because before I got to Congress, I really didn't. You know, you get there, you're, you're, you're running, you're thinking you understand all the pieces of what's going on down in Washington, but this is a pretty interesting slide. Because, again, what, what a lot of people don't understand is that this part of the pie here, this is mandatory spending. This is defense. This is non-discretionary, non-defense. This is discretionary, non-defense spending. When you hear Congress is cutting spending, and you hear about the spending we're cutting, we're cutting in this piece of pie right here. We're not cutting here, and we're not cutting here right now. We're looking at it, and we believe we have to look at everything. But the problem with ever balancing the budget, the problem with ever getting our dead in line, you all put up cards that said we're spending too much, you all put up cards, the majority of it said our debt's too high. The only way we're ever going to fix the problems in Washington is to look at everything. Everything does include these areas over here. And we'll talk a little bit about those as we move forward. I put this, this over here is the exact same slide that I just showed you, but I wanted to show you this slide here because I think it's important. It shows you income tax and corporate tax represent about 32% of what comes into the federal government. Social Security taxes, the payroll taxes, are about 23%. And by the way, this isn't a Jim Renese slide. This isn't a Republican slide. This isn't a Democrat slide. This is a uh, slide that comes from the, the CBO. All the slides I'm giving you are not Republican or Democrat. They are bipartisan slides coming from either the CBO or the General Accounting Office. Social Security taxes amount to about 23%. We borrow about 39 cents of every dollar we spend. So for every dollar that we are spending, we're borrowing 39 cents on the dollar. There are some of you, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about taxes in the future, and I'd like to, I'd like to show this slide just for this purpose. If you double the taxes on everybody, just double it, you still have a deficit. I think that's important for everybody to know. When we talk about taxing people, if you double the tax rate, that's 32%. You still don't have enough to cover what we're borrowing. So keep that in mind as we move forward. The president talked about the Warren Buffett, you know, and uh, that was part of the president's plan. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. These are just a few things that I think are important. Again, this comes from the IRS. You can get this on the internet. This is in a Jim Renacy slide. This actually was part of the Wall Street Journal, um, and it was an ad that shows if you're eight, the, the average taxpayer that makes a million dollars and higher pays 
the average person making 30 to 50,000, 7.2%. Those with uh, AG above 550,000 make up half of the taxpayers pay 92.4% of the taxes. These are higher up statistics. Those with AGI above 200,000 made up 4.8% of the taxpayers paid 52% of all taxes. This is 2008. Those with AGI above $1 million made up 0.4% of all taxpayers paid 24% of all taxes. I'm sure there are some in the room that believe there's people who should pay more taxes. And there's also probably some in the room that believe that the people that make over $200,000 don't pay enough in taxes. I guess the question is whether, when you look at these numbers, whether you agree with that or not. Again, that's your, your, these are just facts that we're presenting here. By the way, something you should know about Warren Buffett and his tax rate, and a lot of people don't realize this. Warren Buffett, the reason his tax rate is less than the ordinary income, and I know this gets down a little bit for, to people who have never, I'm a CPA, I've done tax returns. Warren Buffett's, most of his income is capital gains. Capital gains is taxed at a maximum rate of 15%. So if you think about it, if capital gains is taxed at a maximum rate of 15%, ordinary income grows at a rate much higher than that. Somebody who's making a salary, of course, is going to be taxed at higher than 15%. So those are the kind of things you don't hear from the media when you hear that Warren Buffett's tax rate. But remember, it wasn't that Warren Buffett pays less taxes. It was that Warren Buffett pays his tax rate is less. The House Republicans plan, American Job Creators Empowering Families, Small Business Entrepreneurs. The House Republicans have had a plan. They've presented it. Um, it's been on the internet for almost 10 months. The House has been busy working to grow America's economy by prospering free market solutions. Again, it's one of the things I believe in. It's one of the things the House of Representatives believes in. Here are some of the problems today. Burdensome regulations. I asked you that question earlier because I wanted to see what your thoughts were, and about 85% of you believe we have burdensome regulations. It is one of the problems. Job creators, small business owners, all the people I've been talking to, and I talk to them every day, say, we've got so many regulations, we don't know what we don't know what's next. We have no certainty and predictability. We don't know what the next regulation is going to be. Why would we create another job? Small Business Administration supports government regulations costs our economy over $1.75 trillion per year, and it's rising. So we do have burdens and regulations, and these are the things that we're going to have to, that this Congress, I know, has been looking at. Solution, require con congressional review of the cost-benefit analysis of proposed regulations that will have a significant impact on the economy. Congress passed the Train Act last week. The Train Act basically said and there were some out there that said, oh, the Train Act meant you're trying to take away regulations. It's not true. What the Train Act said was, before they implement another overburdens and regulation, they need to determine what the impact is. Now, if you think about that, how many people would protest that? How many people would say it's not right for somebody to look at the economic impact of a burdens and regulation? Yet, you have people on the other side that say, you're just trying to take a regulation away. No, we're trying to get the EPA to start looking at what the cost of that regulation is, what the economic impact is. Problem like of trade agreements. We have, we have uh, for more than three years, free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, South Korea have sat idle while American businesses are put under increasing disadvantages worldwide. Now, the president has talked about this, so this isn't something that I'm coming up with. The president agrees we've got to get these trade agreements taken care of. We already have um, we already have other countries, Mexico. We already have Canada that have signed these trade agreements. They're already selling to Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. We need to be able to get those done. The president's talked about them. We will pass the pending free trade agreements and encourage more to boost market access worldwide for American businesses. We need to do this. It helps the farmers in Wayne County also helps many small businesses across the country. Rising energy costs. Since 2008, American energy production has been virtually halted, and the average price of gas has doubled, meaning less money in the pockets of family and business owners. This Congress has passed a number of regulations to try and free up the ability for us to drill in the Gulf, for us to cap our own 
of resources. This Congress believes in an all of the above energy process. It believes in everything, oil, gas, coal. This state is full of coal. We should be using it, clean coal. It also believes, this Congress and myself believes that we need to do it properly. We need to do it in the, in the best interest of the environment. But we need to use the assets we have. We are passing bipartisan legislation. It's important that, that you recognize it is bipartisan legislation to expand energy exploration and production, cut down on overly emergency regulation to ensure swift utilization of Ohio's Marcellus and nuclear shell formations. Problem. And again, we're going, uh, this is another problem. Loss of global competitiveness. I asked this question already because I wanted to see what your thoughts were before I presented it. As a combined state and federal rate of over 39%, the U.S. currently has the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world. We will work to set the top rates at a globally competitive 25% for job creating business, leveling the playing field with our competitors. The one thing you need to hear, that you don't hear on the main street media, is that we also believe we need to eliminate loopholes. We need to change the tax code. We need to simplify it. But we need at the same time to bring our rates down to a competitive um, 25%. The House has passed 96 bills at creating private sector American jobs, cutting spending, and reducing the size and scope of government. I'm going to give you just some of the highlights. Because what a lot of people say is, what have you done? What have you guys done for the last nine months? We passed the bill of the President's health care bill. Laws, burdens, and 1099 reporting requirement on small businesses. We stopped the EPA, EPA's efforts to circumvent the federal court rulings with business killing permitting requirements. We passed the Energy Tax Prevention Act, stopping the EPA from issuing new greenhouse gas regulations. We eliminated engineering stippling net neutrality restrictions on the internet. Again, I'm just giving you some highlights. I see you have a white car. I'm going to show what that means. You don't like that? We passed the 2012 GOP budget to pass the prosperity to cut spending, reform entitlements, and the tax code. And see that reform entitlements can be tax code because that does not get out into the main street media. And ensure long term sustainability of Medicare, another thing that's very important. We believe we need to sustain a program that is going to be insolvent if nothing is done. We're going to continue to work to do that. This budget, by the way, went to the uh, Senate. Our budget, the House budget, by the way, it's the first budget passed. I don't know how many people realize when the last time the Senate passed a budget. Any ideas? Over 900 days. Over 900 days since the Senate passed the budget. The House passed the budget, we sent it over to the Senate. The Senate voted on it. It failed 4257, I believe. 4257. Was any, and there was another budget went to the Senate. It was a president's budget. And I'm not sure if anybody heard about that, but does anybody know what the president's budget, um, what the vote was on the president's budget? 97 to 0. 0.499. Again, you don't hear that on the Main Street media, but you can, you can look that up. The president's budget failed the Senate. 0.499 against. We passed three bills to reverse moratorium on offshore energy exploration. I know people always say to me, why aren't we drilling? The House has passed bills to allow us to drill. We passed the Job and Energy Permitting Act to limit the EPA's ability to halt oil and gas leases. We passed a bill allowing oversight and review of regulations issued by the new consumers are and the major financial system. We passed a bill to expedite construction and operation of the Keystone XL pipeline. We passed a bill to limit the NLRB's interference with job creation. I don't know if anybody realizes that, but that's the, um, the most recent action the NLRB took to try and avoid the move of um, or the actually opening up of the plant in South Carolina. We passed the Train Act to curb overregulation of the American energy industry. We passed a bill to overhaul our patent system. What has the Senate accomplished? It's important, what is it? Because we passed a lot of bills. I think I, if, you, if you look on the computer, you'll find out that I have, have voted on probably 700 plus pieces of legislation. Some of them are amendments, but 
700 times I've had to vote. They passed the health, House repeal of the health care laws part of some 1099 regulation. They did do that. They passed the bill to overhaul our patent system. They did do that. The House is waiting on the Senate to pass the rest. So one of the problems we have in our Congress, and I try and tell people because they say, well, you guys got down there, and you should change things. We gave you the ability to change things. No, you gave us the majority of the House. And the problem is, is, as you know, any of you know about the Constitution and our government, there are three bodies in the House. The House can pass anything it wants, the Senate has to take it up. And then after the Senate takes it up, normally there's reconciliation, there's approval, and then it goes to the President. What we have today is we have the Senate that's basically sitting on a pile of bills that we've sent over. American Jobs Act, this is what the President um, presented. The President's job plan. Fortunately, there are some areas where we agree. Passing the free pending trade deals, we talked about that. The president's not yet formally submitted that to Congress. Hopefully, these markets to American business will increase U.S. exports by 13 billion annually, creating nearly 250,000 new jobs. The Congress is ready to do this. Eliminating growth stippling regulations. Remember, this is the president talking. The president took a good first step by overhauling the EPA, by overruling the EPA on overreaching ozone regulation. That rule would have been particularly harmful to local job creators such as the Tipton Company, the Department of Labor, and the SEC have also recently reversed course on high profile overregulation. The president said this in his job bill. We agree with it. We need to move forward with it. Eliminating the 3% withholding requirement on government payments to the contractors. Uh, again, it's interesting because many of these contractors that do business in our country, they only make 3%. And one of the rules was the government was going to withhold 3%. It's a problem. The president agrees with it. We agree with it. We ought to be able to get that fixed too. A simple dictation of depreciation schedules. You know, as a CPA, I understand the cost, time, and pace to comply with our complicated tax code. I support efforts to simplify the code, allowing job creators to spend less time on compliance and more time on hiring. Some areas where we can work together to compromise with the president. Extension of payroll tax reduction. For employers of such a smaller entity to start up reducing the building costs of bringing on a new employee can take some of the risk out of hiring. We can work with the president on this. For employees, economic, economists, and more are estimating that continuing the 2% reduction would raise growth by one full percentage point in the first quarter of 2012 alone. We can work with the president on this. A reworking of unemployment is our president. And the president proposed nationalizing the Georgia plan. I don't agree with the, the, the Georgia plan. I actually have a bill in Congress today, the Employee Act. We'll talk a little bit about it later. But it basically takes people who are unemployed, gets them into, to work for a company. The company gets reimbursed for having them there. The unemployment goes to the company. The, employer pays ta the employee pays taxes. It's a way of reducing our unemployment costs at the same time training people that are unemployed today. This bill I, I, uh, I filed a few months ago. It's working its way through the House. Um, but this is something that I know I personally can work on. The Georgia plan basically leaves somebody on unemployment. They go out, they, um, they get a job, and then there's a subsidy given to them for being there. My plan is a lot better, saves, saves uh, government money. We're going to continue to work on that. There must be not only there must not be any more extension of benefits in the emergency weeks that are currently granted to get us up to 99 weeks must be examined for effectiveness. This is something we have to look at. Let's face it, when we have 99 weeks of unemployment, it does, and I can give you an example of it, for example, of people. Now there are some people who say you need to be taken care of. But clearly, there are those, and like I said, I have family members. They use all 99 weeks. So um, there are those that take advantage of the 99 weeks. Uh, this family member is in Pennsylvania, and, and it doesn't go, it's not a very good Thanksgiving day dinner when we're sitting around the table. Um, he was on about his 50th week last Thanksgiving. Infrastructure spending, infrastructure investment banks, our roads, bridges, waterways, sewers, and the like are a shameful state of disrepair, and infrastructure spending is critical to America's continued prosperity. Infrastructure bank overall federal funding will be 
challenging this political environment. The ability of an infrastructure bank to levy private investment, much like an export-import bank with a small business whose administration is an idea, is working.